This is our seventh lesson on fundamentals of the faith. And this is the last lesson we'll have on inspiration. We'll make some applications of the principles of verbal plenary inspiration. And verbal is the words and grammar and syntax. Syntax is how words are put together in a sentence. And uh, plenary is the word for full or complete, meaning all of it's inspired. Uh, God was the, the script writers of the scripture, even when they recorded the words of those who weren't God's people, uh, they recorded their words accurately. <clears throat> Satan told lies and his lies are recorded in Genesis chapter two and so forth, and three, chapter three. And uh, so we have that. We have uh, the words of Satan in, uh, when he falsely accused Job in the book of Job. But uh, what he said was accurately recorded. Several passages that cannot be understood without these principles will be introduced in this lesson. So this will be application of what we've learned up to this point. We'll study some alleged contradictions in the scriptures in this lesson as well. Alleged is claims that are made, allegations or claims that are made that we have contradictions. I don't believe there are any contradictions, but we'll answer some of the claims to, of the contradictions that have occurred. We'll consider some errors of some various religions in this uh, lesson as well, some false religions, some claim to be Christians even. We'll consider some errors within the Lord's church on this in this on this lesson as well. Sometimes even some members of the church commit errors. Here's one of the alleged contradictions that's made. A claim is made that Galatians 6 2 and Galatians 6 5 are contradictory. Where it says, Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And verse 5 says, for each man shall bear his own burdens. So one verse says, bear another's burdens. And the, in the verse 5, then verse 2 does. And verse 5 says, each man shall bear his own burden. The problem here is, that supposedly Paul is giving contradictory commandments here in this. In these uh, two verses, just three verses apart. The problem is, that we have two different Greek words translated bear. And so the English translation has a problem with it. Uh, some of the modern speech English translations don't translate the words the same as, as look burden. The word in verse two is baros in Hebrew and the Greek rather. And it's a, it's a bear an overload burden. This is a burden that's too heavy for one to bear. And so you're to help him with it. I believe in the context, the burden that he's bearing is sin. He's um, a member of the church has got caught up in sin in this context. You're to help him get out of it and bear, help him bear that burden to get him out of that sin. So fulfill the law of Christ. Now look at verse one and you can see that how it fits the context. Now that's an overload burden in verse two, but in verse Five, it's for fortion, and it's a different Greek word. And this is a normal pack, a normal burden that one would bear in carrying his own load. And so each man should bear his own burden. And so this, of uh, course, is a completely different word. And we have, uh, um, unfortunately, the English translators translated both these words the same way. And uh, so there's an apparent contradiction, but there's no real contradiction because it's two different words. And one of them is an overload burden in verse two. And then this is a normal burden in verse five. Some of the modern speech translation translated load and bur uh, burden, two different ways in English. Any questions about that, about that passage? This is the American Standard Version, 1901, translated 1901. 
atheists have alleged, and again, these are further allegations, they made the claim that John 20, verse 17, I've got a chair this week, so I'm going to change chairs. Okay. They make the claim that Matthew 28, 9 and John 20, verse 17 have some kind of contradiction. Let's look at these two passages. First John 20, verse 17. Jesus saith unto her, this is Mary Magdalene, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended unto the Father, but go unto my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. So he told her not to touch him. And he, in verse chapter 28 of Matthew, verse 9, and behold, Jesus met them, and this is other women, saying, all hail, and they came and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. So now they, they took hold of his feet. And our problem is, supposedly they're contradictory instructions. Here's a proper explanation. Jesus is telling Mary Magdalene to stop clinging to him. And that's what the original actually says. Touch there is clinging to him. She was grabbing a hold of him and holding on to him. So he bids her to go and tell the disciples and is in effect telling her, you'll get to see me again. And I think she did get to see me again, most likely. But he tells her to go, and so she's the first one there. And so she runs and tells the disciples that he's risen. Of course, because she's a woman, they wouldn't believe her. And so they, uh, Jesus rebu rebuked them later for not believing her and the other women who also were witnesses. Because Mary had already gone to inform the other disciples. Now the disciples are going to be informed. He allows the other women to touch him, perhaps to produce faith. We see this in Luke 24:39 as well. In Luke 24:39. See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me. He's not talking to the women here, he's talking to the, to the disciples who, who became apostles. And see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as to behold me having. Now, he's telling them there, uh, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. Take my, see my hands and feet. And so he tells them not only to see him, but to handle him. And this means to touch him to put their hands on the, in the nail prints. Now we see this, it's possible the women were allowed to feel the nail prints in his hands and feet to make sure it was really Jesus. And the, the nail prints would be there in his hands and feet. And, and uh, so it's quite likely that this is what happened here. In John 20, verse 27, and he saith, he then saith he to Thomas, back up a minute, the 10 disciples are here. Remember, Judas Iscariot's already dead. So we have 11 left. And Thomas is not here in this instance in Luke 24, 39. And a little bit earlier. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and see my hands, and thither thy hand and put it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. So you put your finger in the nail prints of my hand, put your hand in my side, and you know it's really me. Now, Thomas here, at this moment, and I'll digress just a quick, quick moment here. Thomas, at this moment, he said, the Lord of me and the God of me, in Greek. And he says it, and that's a literal translation. He recognized that Jesus is God. And he's the first apostle that actually said that Jesus is deity of God. I think Thomas, when he heard that he's resurrected, he began to put things together. And people talk about him, call him Doubting Thomas. But Thomas was saying, I have to see this myself. And I won't believe unless I see it. Because Thomas, in his mind, he'd already figured out that Jesus is God, was God in the flesh. And that was a new thought. And I think Thomas, uh, I, I know he's the first one that, that the Bible records actually saying he's deity. 
Any questions or comments? So this is a side point about Thomas. Uh, sermon talked about how he was doubting Thomas, but he was doubting because he was saying in his mind, he was saying he has to be God in the flesh because he put together all the other things Jesus had taught and said. And so I, I see it here. I'm convinced that that's the situation. Now, let's go back now. So he put his finger in the nail prints and his hand in the side. And let's look at 1 John 1, 1, where John speaks of it now. And John says, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes. Now, he's talking about the things relating to Jesus. The words that which are in the later gender. It's referring not to the person of Jesus, but the things about or concerning Jesus. That which we've seen with our eyes. So we saw it with our eyes. We gazed upon it. That's literally what that means. And we would say in English, he stared at it. He just looked and looked and looked at it, kept looking at it. And that's actually the thrust of the, of the Greek here in this passage. And, of course, in English, if you stare at someone, that's considered to be rude, in the United States at least. And so they were looking and gazing upon the nail prints and his feet and his hands and, the, and in his side. So let's go back and read this again. That which was from the beginning, from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, that which we beheld and our hands handled concerning the word of life. So we saw it, we heard it, we heard him speak, and we handled him, we touched him. So they used three of their senses, three of their five senses that we have. Our five senses are smelling, tasting, touching, hearing, and seeing. Now we have the sense of balance, and I call it a, a, a sixth sense. And each, some of those senses could be subdivided. I'm not going to do that for our purposes. They used three of their senses to determine that he was Jesus in the flesh. And, of course, they had seen the fact that he had died. They knew that. So now they know he's resurrected. And Jesus let them touch him, let him handle him, let them put their hands handling him. And so these disciples now... All of them except John, if I read the Bible correctly, are going to die because they are going to stand firm and tell the world that he was resurrected. And Jesus gave them all the information, everything they needed to know. Let them touch, let them feel, let them hear him, let them see him. With three of their senses. And I don't know, uh, people have a... a this, some people have a distinct odor or smell to them, and it's not necessarily a bad smell, but uh, they do have a distinct uh, odor or smell, and they might have had that as well, but the Bible doesn't tell us that's the case. But we told us these three, and that's all I need to know. Any question about that? So the, let's look at some errors of some false religions. Some false religions claim sinless perfection. I've studied with people that say, well, we don't sin anymore because we got the second working of grace. And uh, this is uh, some that are uh, teaching the doctrines of uh, Wesleyanism, John Wesley's doctrine, doctrines. In 1 John 3, 6, whosoever abideth in him uh, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither knoweth him. So now we got a problem. Because it looks like it's saying we don't sin anymore. But what does it really mean? Our problem is the English language, the verbs in English are not the same as the verbs in Greek. The tense of verbs in English denote primarily time. Action recurring, future tense is something's going to happen in the future, time wise. Tense in English primarily denotes time. And uh, we'll use a participle to indicate continuous or derivative action. So 
the uh, past tense, we had perfect tense and so forth, and future tense and present tense, those are your primary tenses. Whereas in Greek, the tenses indicate kind of action, not time so much. And in the indicative mood, which is a statement of fact, there's time in the tenses, but it's very incidental. It's kind of a side point. It's not the primary thrust of the Greek verb. So what is this Greek verb saying? This Greek, Greek verb is a present tense verb, and it's saying whosoever abides and keeps on abiding in him, keeps on not sinning, right? Whosoever sinneth has not, the one that continually practices sin has not seen him and doesn't continue to know him. It's a continuous abiding and it's a continuous sinning. He doesn't keep on sinning. He's not saying he doesn't sin one time occasionally from time to time out of weakness or ignorance. It's saying he doesn't make a life of sin because the thrust of the verb is to make a life of it or to be one who continually does it. Does it. So right here then, that's what this is saying. In 1 John 3, 9, whosoever is begotten of God doeth no sin. What that means is it's continuous action. He doesn't keep on sinning because his seed keeps on abiding in him. The seed, of course, is the word, and he cannot sin. And again, this cannot eventually continue to sin, but live in a life of sin because he's begotten of God. And we go back we can see this in First John 1, when we look at this, supposedly the, the Holy Spirit keeps you from sinning. That's the doctrine that's taught. Sinneth not is continuous, habitual, continuous action in the Greek. The verb does, indicates that. One doesn't live a life of sin, but he may occasionally sin. And that's what we get to First John 1, 8, which says if we say that we have no sin, this is a different kind of verb. This is a, a point action, a, a, a verb that's used it for sometimes for single act or point action. And so if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth's not in us. So now then, the, the, those appear to be contradictory in the sense one says you don't sin anymore and the other says if you say you don't sin, have no sin, you deceive yourselves, ourselves. So let's go back and look at them again. This one says, if, if he abides in him, he doesn't sin. And his son begotten does not sin, doeth no sin. Then over here it says, that if we say we don't sin, we lie, we deceive ourselves. So what's the solution? There are two different Greek verbs for sin. One of them is a derivative continuous habitual action, and the one in 1 John 1, 8 is a single act, viewed as a single act. Occasionally you will sin because of weakness or ignorance, and this will happen. But he's, he's saying you won't live in a life of sin, you won't make it your practice to be sinning all the time or continuously sinning. So that's the difference in them. It's the di the difference is in the verbs. Any questions? I don't know other languages. Uh, Tyson, does does the uh, uh, you use do you have Telugu? Is that what language you have? In India, there. Okay. I just wondered what how the Telugu language would would handle that. Okay, all right. All right. Let's look at Ephesians two eight. Some denominations teach that salvation is by grace only, because they neglect the grammar of such passages. Ephesians two eight. Now notice here in Ephesians two eight. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Now in English, the word that refers to a distant, distant object or something in the distance. And the word this, T-H-I-S, 
refers to something up near. So that, not of yourselves, the distant object. So the word that does not refer to either the words grace or faith. Either one of them refers to either one of them. And the, the solution to this is that the Greek pronoun has gender, and whereas the English pronoun doesn't. And, but the Greek pronoun does have gender, and the word that is neuter gender, and the words grace and faith are feminine gender. Abstract nouns in Greek are usually in the feminine gender, and grace and faith are both in the feminine gender. So the word that cannot refer to either the words grace or faith. And in the context, it refers no doubt to the word salvation, which is neuter gender. So, for by grace have you been saved through faith, and that, that salvation, see, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The word saved is a verb up here, and uh, so it's not referring to that word, but it's referring to the noun that goes with the word saved. Uh, so, uh, my interpretation is, for by grace have you been saved through faith, and that, that, that salvation, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And again, the word that probably refers to salvation, something other than either grace or faith. Because the words grace and faith, again, as I said, are feminine gender in Greek, the word that's neuter gender, and they have to agree in gender. So it cannot refer to either one of those. Right? Any questions? In Greek, it has gender, it cannot refer to either the words grace or faith. The Greek pronoun must agree in gender with the noun to which it refers. It's called its antecedent. A-N-T-E is Latin for before, and so it's the, it's the word that goes before it to refer to it. And uh, words that refer to pronouns that uh, uh, refer to commandments and so forth, uh, they will tend to uh, they'll tend to take a post but let's not worry about that. Some denominations teach that Peter is the rock by which the church is built, and they get this from Matthew 16, 18 through 19. And I also say unto thee that thou art Peter, and from this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now. We'll talk about this in just a minute. But Peter, the word Peter is Petros. It means a loose rock, a small rock, broken off piece of rock. And the word rock, the word upon this rock is Petra. It's a bedrock. And so there's a difference. Now, they are from the same root, but I don't believe uh, they're the same, uh, certainly not the same word. They're from the same root word. But Peter is a broken off piece of rock, and the word rock that Jesus used is not the word Peter, but it's the word Petra, which is a, uh, a large piece of rock, a bedrock, a big layer of rock, something solid. And so the rock here, I think, is the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that Peter had just made the confession that he had just made. So the rock that the church is built upon is the truth that Jesus is deity. The term son of God refers to one who is like God in every respect, so he is deity. Uh, the Jews understood when he claimed to be the son of God, they understood that he was claiming to be God. And on a couple of occasions we see this occurring. So they understood full well what it meant. And he says, I will build my church upon that foundation, that, that bedrock of truth, that I am, that I, Jesus, am deity, I'm God in the flesh. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, as, as a side point here, uh, this would only apply to those that have studied Greek, but the Greek has a middle voice, and the middle voice is English has active and passive voices, 
Greek has active and passive. But Greek also has another voice called the middle voice where the subject does something to himself or for his own benefit. And uh, so if a person was uh, brushing his hair or, or washing his body or clothing himself, it would be in the middle voice. And Jesus, the middle voice is used a number of times for Jesus being resurrected from the dead. He resurrected himself. Yet other verses tell us the Father was involved in the resurrection. I think I could also prove the Holy Spirit was involved. I think the whole Godhead was involved in the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus wasn't passive in it. He was involved in it. And so the gates of Hades, because I am deity, Jesus is saying, they can't keep, I can't be kept in, in Hades, in the unseen realm, the realm of the dead. I, I, will, I will come out of Hades. Questions or comments? So right here, he goes back, let's go to verse 19 now. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This passage here is misunderstood. The word translated Peter and the Aramaic word Cephas both mean a rock or a broken off piece of rock. Now in English, there's a difference between a rock and a stone, just as there is in Greek. A rock is just some piece that's been broken. It could be all different shapes, but a stone is something that's been smooth and shaped somehow. Could be shaped by running water like in a, in a stream and the rocks will and the stream the, the stones in a stream will tend to be rounded because the moving water will, will wear them off and make them rounded but the word cephas the word cephas is more of a stone also mean a rock or a stone so jesus uh, called peter he called him simon peter the rock a rock or a broken off piece of rock. So the word translated Peter is, and the, and the Aramaic word translated Cephas both mean a rock. The word rock, bedrock, is feminine gender, and the word Peter, small rock, is masculine gender. Again, we have a gender situation where they're different. Now, English, uh, old English used to have some the same distinction, but they lost the, the, the language, lost it as the language was simplified. And uh, so our, our language is different than it was uh, oh, about 500 years ago or so. Been some changes. So the authority given to Peter, let's go back and look at it. And this is another point we need to make. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I believe Peter was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, we don't have time to go through this, but I do go through it in some of my notes on uh, introduction to the Bible and the uh, some other classes that we teach here. Uh, so the word keys, uh, the keys that he was given were used in Acts 2. Peter was the one that stood up and led the teaching and was the lead speaker in Acts 2. He opened the door for the kingdom of heaven for people to enter it by telling them how to become Christians, how to become children of God. And in Acts 10, he opened it to the Gentiles. So in Acts 2, he opened it to the Jews, in Acts 10 to the Gentiles, and since everybody in the earth is either a Jew or a Gentile, he opened it to the, everybody in the whole world, all races, Jew and Gentile both. And if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. No matter what your race is, you're a Gentile. And that would be people from South America, from Africa, from Asia, and uh, North America, Australia. All of these continents uh, would be Gentiles, except that those who are descendants of Jacob, Israel, his name was changed to Israel, children of Israel. Everybody else would be a Gentile. So Peter opened the door to them. Now then he tells them, whatsoever thou shalt bind, verse 19, look at it, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Some of the modern speech American, uh, 
an English translation to have a better rendering of this. American, the American Standard Version has a good rendering. There's some others that have a good rendering. This is the pre, uh, future perfect tense in Greek. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven is a better rendering. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. What this is saying, and we can prove it with other scripture, that God had already decided what was going to be bound and loosed. So he bound upon the church, on the kingdom of God, certain things. For instance, he bound upon the church that you have to have the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. I believe I can prove that. He bound upon the church the obligation to be baptized. And these are things that were not bound upon the Jews on the children of Israel. Now, John the Baptist came preaching it, but I believe, as we'll see later, he was preparing them for the church. What did he lose? He lost the keeping of the uh, some of the ordinances, Sabbath keeping, uh, the meeting of certain kind of meats, only certain kind of meats, and uh, he allowed, allowed Christians to eat any kind of meat that they want. And so they lose certain things there that have been bound upon the children of Israel. Any questions or comments? Right. Now, you say, well, Peter had, he had the power to bind and loose. Verse 19. Well, that's Peter, yes, that's who he's speaking. But about two chapters later in Matthew 18, 18, Jesus said, verily, which is the same word as amen. And so it's true, it's firm, it's established. This is firm, this is established. This is a true statement. I say unto you, what things ever ye, now then notice here, I know this is the American Standard Version. In the King James and American Standard Versions, the words ye and you are plural. And your, ye, you and your are all plural. Whereas be thou and thine are singular. That's the older English. The modern English don't doesn't use thee, thou and thine. It's still in the dictionary, but it's not used very much by most people. So rarely that we use it sometimes in poetry. But rarely I say unto you, he's talking to all the apostles. But what's everything ye shall bind on us, you apostles, all of you shall have been bound in heaven. Again, this is future perfect tense in Greek. So it should be translated, shall have been bound in heaven. And what thanks ever ye, you apostles, all of you apostles shall loose on earth, shall have been loosed in heaven. God had already decided what the apostles were going to preach. They didn't have the option of just making up what they wanted to make up. They were guided by the Holy Spirit in what they preached. And so they only taught what the Holy Spirit gave them to teach. Any questions? All right. Some denominations teach that all that is necessary to be saved is to pray. These groups usually equate prayer to calling upon God. And Ananias explains how we call on the Lord, Acts 22, 16. And now why Terry said, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on his name. But in both English and Greek, the participle, the word calling is a participle, it explains or can be used in an adverbial sense to explain the, the word baptized and wash away. So what are we doing when we're baptized? We wash away our sins and we're calling on his name. So calling on his name, appealing to his authority. His name would be by his authority. We're appealing to the authority of the Lord to have our sins washed away. So calling explains what we do when we're baptized. That's what we do. That's how we call the name of the Lord. We obey him. We're baptized and washed away our sins. The sins are washed away when we call on his name. Calling is a participle that explains the act of baptism, the verb baptize. Baptism is the means by which we call upon the Lord. I believe in calling upon the name of the Lord, but we do it when we obey the Lord's commands. Now, questions or comments?
look at a passage that is perhaps misunderstood. It's not a big deal. It's not major. In John 21, 15. We, because of failure to discern the true meaning of the word these. But when they had broken their fast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, and his father's name was John, Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. And he repeats this three times. The first two times he says, uh, Feed my lambs, and then he says, Feed my sheep. But he uses different words for love. We don't, we don't get into that. Uh, he uses the word agape, agapao verb, twice in this context, and then he changes to a different word for love in the last time he used, he talked about it. So Jesus changed to the weaker form of love. But he says, love is something more than these, these what? Well, one interpretation is, do you love me more than these other disciples love me? Well, if the Lord asks me that, I can't know it. I don't know whether my love is stronger than your love. I would assume that you have a great love for God. Your love may be stronger than mine. I can't say. And it's pretty arrogant of me to assume that I love God more than you love God. And so I, I just won't, won't do that. And there, I've heard people say, well, he's asking Peter, did you love me more than these other disciples love me? Well, Peter had, of course, denied Jesus three times. And so Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Some think that he asked him that for that reason. That might be the case. Again, that's that's an assumption. It may, may be true, though. But here, the word these, the word these, the gender of it is such that it could be masculine, feminine, or neuter, any one of those three. And our problem is it could refer to these disciples or it could refer to these fish that they were eating at that time. Uh, I think it may be the fish, and he might be saying very, very likely, he's asking Peter if his love is greater than the love of the other disciples. Now, I don't think that's probably not the case. Uh, he's probably asking if he loves him more than these fish that uh, Peter had been out there catching. Remember, he went back to fishing after, and he's supposed to have been waiting for the Lord, and he went, he went fishing. And the word these, Two-tone probably refers to the words, the words, the fish, and we have it here in Greek. So the word these could be the masculine, feminine, or neuter. If it's neuter, it refer to the fish. I don't know uh, which it is. I don't. I can't tell you because the Greek could be either one of the three. Unfortunately, in this uh, genitive form, uh, it has the same form for all three genders. Your other, your other cases uh, have different forms. So uh, unfortunately, the genitive doesn't. Any questions? So I think it probably refers to the fish, but I don't know. But we shouldn't uh, get in an uproar about it because Peter knew what he's talking about, I'm sure. Uh, so we don't, we don't have a problem there. Possible paraphrase, Peter, do you love me more than you do your fishing business? Are you willing to give up your fishing business and come and be an apostle of mine? Say, make your, make your decision. We have a saying in the United States, uh, either fish or cut bait. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's kind of a saying we have. If you're either going to start fishing or you're going to be cutting bait so somebody else can fish. So what are you going to do? Okay, get busy. And so Peter, I may be just kind of saying something like that to him. Peter, make you just make up your mind. Are you going to be one? Are you going to be one of my apostles? And Peter, of course, was when it went and became uh, an apostle, of course. Some read the personal indwelling into James 4 5. And uh, the word indwell is not in the good translation of the Bible. The word dwell is there's a difference in meaning. The word indwell implies some kind of direct operation, whereas the word dwell does not in English. 
The translators in James 4, 5 used a lowercase s in this verse. This was their interpretation, but I, I don't have any doubt in my mind it's probably correct. Or think ye that the scripture speaketh in vain, doth the spirit which he made to dwell in us long at the envy. Now is this the Holy Spirit or is this the or human spirit? Say, which one is it? Now envying, now jealousy is, the word jealous is not necessarily used in a bad way every time. God is a jealous God, so he does not sin, so we know it's not used in a bad way with respect to God. And the word jealous and zealous are the same Greek word. So I can be zealous for the Lord, and that's good, see? So, but the word envy is a different word. It kind of overlaps in meaning in a lot, in a, to a great descent, extent. But the word envying is always used in a bad sense. So is he asking, does this Holy Spirit belong under envying? Uh, just to ask that question would be a foolish question if you think about the Holy Spirit envying because it's uh, something that's sinful. No, this is a human spirit that he's talking about in this sense. Right? Lowercase s, or it could be even a disposition. Lust and envy are not properly uh, attributed to the Holy Spirit. So he says, maybe it was a long and envying, lust, longing is lusting, and envying. This must refer to man's spirit instead of the Holy Spirit. It might be a disposition, but I think it's man's spirit in this context. Any questions? Let's summarize this lesson, if we might, here. And uh, some falsely claim the scriptures have contradiction errors because they neglect to consider the gra grammar syntax and the word meanings. Some religious groups teach doctrinal error because they neglect to consider the grammar and syntax and the word meanings as well. Some in the Lord's Church even teach doctrinal error because they neglect to consider the word, word meaning and grammar and syntax. Are there questions or comments?